Hello and welcome. Today we are going to be talking about macro photography. By definition, macro photography is just photography producing photos of small items larger than the life size. Today I'm going to go over a few different ways that you can achieve macro photography results and a few different techniques to help you improve your macro photos along the way. Let's get into it. The first way to achieve a macro photography result is with what is known as a macro lens. This is the easiest way to take a macro photo as it is a lens made explicitly for macro photography. Super easy, super simple. The main difference that separates a macro lens from its non-macro counterpart, in my case a 90mm macro versus a 90mm portrait lens, is its ability to focus on items at a very close distance often a few millimeters away. It has what is known as a magnification ratio of one to one. Now, what is a magnification ratio and how does it impact your photos? The magnification ratio is simply just the relationship between whatever you're shooting and its projection onto your screen, film, sensor, whatever. This lens happens to have a magnification ratio of one to one, making it a true macro lens. What does that mean? Well, this lens is also known as a macro lens, but this is just fancy marketing. This lens only has a magnification ratio of 1 to 2.8. By this point, you're probably wondering, what the heck does a magnification ratio even mean? What does it do for my photos? Well, a magnification ratio simply just means that if I'm photographing something that is 20 millimeters wide, it will pass through my lens if it is a 1 to 1 ratio and transfer a 20 millimeter projection onto my sensor. It doesn't matter if it's an APS-C sensor, a micro four third sensor, or a full frame sensor, 20 millimeters of information is traveling from the subject to my sensor. Now, as in the case of this 70 to 200 macro lens, which has a magnification ratio of one to 2.8, all that means is that if I have 20 millimeters of subject that is in focus through this lens, that 20 millimeters will pass through this lens and a projection of seven millimeters or 20 divided by 2.8 will be projected onto my sensor, resulting in less magnification or a less macro image. This is why having a one-to-one -one ratio or something near that is desirable when taking macro photos. Something to note is that dedicated macro lenses like this 90 millimeter lens are not just used for macro photography. They are fantastic lenses for almost everything that you can use a 90 millimeter lens for. As I said, this is simply just a 90 millimeter lens with an ability to focus on things very close by, but that does not limit it to just focusing on things close by. It can also focus on portraits or trees or birds, whatever you would like to take a photo of, this lens will do it. What this also implies is that at the macro photography scale, when I'm taking pictures of bugs or plants or whatever, I'm going to get very similar results as I would when I'm shooting at a regular scale. Because this is a portrait lens and it separates my subject from the background beautifully, it will do the exact same thing, offering a nice blurred background when I'm shooting at a macro scale. This also goes for using wide angle macros or telephoto macros. If you're shooting a wide angle lens, you'll probably notice that your depth of field will be much deeper and you'll have a lot more in your field of view. This operates exactly the same in macro photography. Thomas Shahan has a great video on wide angle macro photography. I would highly recommend you check that out. He explains the ups and downs of using wide angle lenses when taking macro photos. At the end of the day, when you're choosing a dedicated macro photography lens, I would recommend looking at something above 50 millimeters and below 120 millimeters. This offers you a nice range of focal lengths that help separate your tiny little subject from its background while also being readily available and far cheaper than anything at the outside of that range. Don't let that stop you though. If you feel like spending thousands of dollars, go right ahead. I do not care. The second and probably the most popular way to take macro photos is with extension tubes. Extension tubes look like this and they can come in sets really similar to the one I have where they snap together like bionicles. They're really nice. As you've probably assumed, one of the huge benefits of having extension tubes is their modularity. You can pick and choose what focal length you have on your camera with extension tubes. You're not fixed to just whatever my dedicated lens is, 90 millimeters in my case, you have the option to add, in this case, 36 mil, 20 mil, or 12 mil, or all of them together, or just two of them. Whatever you would like to do, however close you would like to get, 
extension tubes will get you there. One thing to note is that extension tubes come in two different flavors, powered and non-powered. Powered extension tubes like these have electrical nodes, these little guys right here. These nodes allow the extension tube to pass the information from your lens to your camera and vice versa, changing settings like your aperture or whether or not you like to use autofocus. Full disclosure, if you're taking macro photos, you're probably not gonna be using autofocus. So the only thing these tubes are really, really good for is letting you decide whatever your aperture is. Another perk of extension tubes is that they're really cheap. My extension tubes were about 40, 50 bucks, uh, much cheaper than my macro lens, which was closer to $600 when I bought it, making them a pretty obvious contender for your macro photo needs. Extension tubes work simply by extending the focal length of your camera, getting your front element of whatever lens you choose to pop on the end of these closer to your subject. By virtue of them extending your focal length, the light let in to your camera is going to be decreased. This is because aperture is also just a ratio that is dependent on the focal length of your lens. So if I take a picture of my subject at f2.8 with my lens without my extension tubes and then take a picture of the same subject with the extension tubes attached with the exact same settings, my image will be darker slightly. This means that by necessity, you will have to increase your light levels either by adjusting your settings or by introducing a flash or changing your composition in some manner to keep your light levels the same if that is your desired effect. The last of the three most popular methods used to take macro photos is by simply reversing your lens. So if my lens generally points this way away from my camera body, which is currently taking this video, I will take this lens off, flip it, and take photos through it like this. Now, this comes with a few caveats. One, it's pretty tricky to do. There are a few ways to get around this. One of these ways is to get a coupling ring. A coupling ring simply attaches to the front of your lens and then onto the body of your camera, just screws on just like an ND filter or something like that. Another way to kind of make this a little easier on yourself is to either have or purchase a older lens that has an aperture ring, much similar to the ring on this wide angle fisheye that I have that I can control the aperture of manually. The reason this matters is because if you don't have an aperture ring, you are stuck adjusting your aperture with this tiny little node right here. It's a super big pain in the butt, offering you essentially the option to either shoot with the maximum aperture of your lens, which in this case is f22, or the minimum, which is f1.8. Another drawback of using the lens reversal technique is that it opens up your lens and your camera sensor to damage or debris. Essentially, your lens, when it's attached to your camera, acts as a seal between your sensor and the outside world. Once you take that lens off, that seal is no longer there, and you have the opportunity to get dust and debris in there. Personally, I've never had an issue with this, but just be mindful of that while you shoot with a reverse lens. Another risk that you may run into is opening up your rear element to damage against whatever your subject is. So, if you're shooting spiky rocks or a porcupine or something really sticky and gross, I would recommend not using the lens reversal technique as whatever that photo is, it probably isn't worth the price of whatever your lens is. Unless it is, in which case, do it. As you'll discover, macro photography is at the mercy of the same rules that all photography is at the mercy of. Your lighting, your composition, the interest of your subject, it is all at play in macro photography. You don't lose any of that when you get down to the micro scale. So keeping this in mind, how do we approach these tiny little situations in a more artistic way? What I found is to eliminate as many variables as possible. Focus is the name of the game. If you're able to get your subject in focus, you've already achieved what many cannot. Macro photography is so hard that in fact, getting your subject in focus is often the hardest part about the whole thing. You have your lighting set up, you have everything set up, your composition's mint, your subject's super cool, but getting it in focus is really tough. And this is something that beginner macro photographers will struggle with. You'll find your technique as you go, but I assure you it is absolutely worth your time to put your energy into finding a way that helps you focus your camera in the best possible manner. There's two things to think of here. You can choose to shoot at a low aperture at f1.8 or 2.8, whatever it is, but this comes at the cost of depth of field. And macro photography scales you are dealing with a depth of field of only a few millimeters and every little stop really, really helps keep your subject in focus. But this comes with the necessity of more light. So if you wanna shoot wide open and have a ton of light in your image, you will have to hunt for that focus a little bit more. If you wanna shoot stopped down, you will have to introduce more light 
or switch up your composition in some manner. One of the huge benefits of operating with a dedicated macro lens is that they can stop down to something crazy like f64 and sometimes even higher. What this means is that at the necessity of throwing in more light into your situation, you will have a really tack sharp image without having to do something like focus stacking. All focus stacking is is just combining a bunch of images into one to make sure your subject is in focus. At the bare minimum, to take a focus stacked image, you'll need a tripod or a monopod. However, a lot of people will say you'll need a tripod and a monopod to take macro photos anyway, which I disagree with. The reason I disagree with this is because you can take macro photos just handheld, but you have to get creative about how you stabilize your camera. One method that I like to use is to basically plant my camera right on my chest or stick it out in front of me with my strap tight between my neck and the camera, making it nice and stable. You can also get creative with what you place your camera on, like a rock or a log or a branch or whatever, so that your subject remains sharp. I really recommend practicing using your hands as little blocks or by just winging it and taking a high shutter speed image. Whatever method works the best for you is the one that you should use. However, it is good to know how to use all of these methods so that once you're in the field or once you come across a situation that you can't quite predict the next move of, it is good to know how to use and when to use these different methods so that if you come across a use case, then you do know how to use them. Under this video in the description, I'll provide a link to some gear that you may want to check out if you'd like to get into macro photography. I'll try to keep it budget friendly, but just in case we have a few big spenders out there, I'll include some nice spendy options for you as well. Let me know how your journey goes. Macro photography is super fun. Remember, at the end of the day, focus on focus. If you're able to get your subject in focus at a tiny little scale, you've broken through a barrier that many cannot. If you're able, Keep light and composition in mind. This will help elevate your photos and help you throw a little bit of your own spice onto your images. All of these methods are interchangeable and work really, really well depending on the situation that you're in. So be open-minded, be flexible, try and use them in their best case scenario. Remember, as always, if you have a good time taking your photos, and you will because taking macro photos is super fun and relaxing, and you have a good time editing them, which you will because the photos you take are gonna be pretty sweet, then uh, that's all that really matters. See ya.